Hey, welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Thank you for tuning into this new episode. Um, I hope and pray everything is good with you. I know it's been a minute because I know last week I took the weekend off because there was a lot going on in my personal life. And then it was Father's Day weekend. So I had a lot of hanging out and a lot of time spending to do with my fam and all that. So it was a good weekend. But now I'm back because there is so much going on that I have to discuss and I want to discuss in this episode There's matches and reckonings and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So um, I'm going to get into it with your regular news and gossip-ish. I'm going to tailor my wrestling fan story time to talk about everything that's going on with the speaking out um, reckonings and allegations and all of the above. And then I'm going to talk about what happened on the weekly programming. So sit back, relax, and listen to this new episode of Hardy Wrestling with your girl, Stephanie Hardy. I miss y'all. All right, so this is the news and gossipish segment where I talk about everything that's going on in the news and also on social media in terms of rumblings that's going on and the things that we've sort of heard about and speculate about but aren't that aren't necessarily true or possibly founded or whatever. So we're gonna start um, with the fact that nine years ago today was the CM Punk infamous or famous, depending on who you ask pipe bomb promo that he um put on the wwe in 2011 now as you as some of you may or may not know cm punk whose real name is phil brooks started off as a wrestler in the independent scene in ring of honor and then also a little bit in new japan pro wrestling before he came to the wwe and sort of you know had this different sort of look to him where he looked like like a tattooed dude And he was just sort of smaller as opposed to the bigger dudes that WWE tends to favor a lot of the time, or at least would favor back then. And he would win all kinds of championships and everything because he had, you know, the it factor in terms of athleticism. And he sort of represented um, the wrestling fans that don't necessarily look or act like the polished stars that we see all the time that look like models or look like, you know, fitness dudes or whatever. And he had become discontented in his time with with the WWE behind the scenes and he just felt like you know he felt like he had a lot to offer in terms of all of his athleticism and with everything he had done he had won money in the bank two times he had won different championships and all of the above but he never felt like he was ever treated like a main event or top star because at the time a lot of those opportunities went to people like John Cena and went to people like The Rock who were like part-time wrestlers and he felt like it wasn't necessarily fair for him to be working as hard as he was and he wasn't getting those same opportunities so this dude (laughs) decided to go on Monday Night Raw after a match that um John Cena had had and sit down in on the ramp and talk about his grievances with the company he was basically talking about how he felt like john cena was sort of labeled the best in the business and how he was just like you know i hate this idea that you're the best because i'm the best wrestler and i've been the best ever since day one ever since i walked in in this place and he was talking about how in different aspects how not even just in wrestling but also in commentary you know there's really no one who could touch him but yet somehow or another he was always you know passed over for this big name dude who was always, you know, not really the best in terms of athleticism, but, you know, he was just the guy they put out there as the advertising face of the company. And he was just sick of it. And he basically made the statement of sort of Vince McMahon sort of making money to spite himself and how, you know, he's going to, you know, how people and fans are always going to, you know, pour money into the company regardless of how he feels. And... He also discussed how he felt like um, maybe the company would be better after Vince McMahon passed away, but really the company was just going to be passed on to his, what he called his idiotic daughter, um, who was Stephanie McMahon and, you know, his son-in-law, who who, his doofus son-in-law, 
um this is what he said not me um triple h and the rest of his stupid family and it makes me wonder if with everything that has happened within the past nine years of wrestling and all of the above and how the internet has sort of taken a you know a huge front seat in terms of how wrestling fans express themselves it makes me wonder if to a certain degree this pipe bomb is sort of used as a means of you know a prophecy sort of fulfilling itself in how a lot of internet wrestling fans feel discontented with wwe at times and then they sort of use this as a they use this speech as a tool to sort of drive home this negativity cloud over WWE and talk about, you know, all the things and all the problems that they have. Now, every, a lot of the stuff that CM Punk has said has sort of manifested itself to a certain degree. But in my personal opinion, I really don't think that Triple H himself, you know, has ran WWE into the ground and if anything he's made it better with his contributions towards nxt and the performance center and how it's given us such great stars over you know more recent years especially with the women and especially with some of the men as well like in wwe today there are so many stars on television now who came through the nxt banner and you can't necessarily say that triple h hasn't had anything to do with that because he has and for all of the hangups that people try to put on WWE, there's still so much stuff that they do great as well. So um, since then, of course, CM Punk is no longer with the company. He left in 2014 and he has gone on to star in about, I believe, two movies. And he's also gone on to write for Marvel Comics and he's also... And he's and he also used to be on WWE backstage, which they're not really doing as a weekly programming show anymore because that got canceled this week um, because of um, the crisis and how it's sort of affecting jobs and everything. But there's always a huge fan base that misses CM Punk and what he had to offer to the um, company. And then there are a lot of fans who feel like maybe him, maybe he was, you know, ahead of his time along with his wife, AJ Lee, who used to wrestle as well, that maybe both of them were just ahead of their time because back then there wasn't, in the company, there wasn't much of an open mind for wrestlers like them, whereas now it's more of it, but they just sort of, you know, it was sort of like they were the right wrestlers, but it was just the wrong time for them. So it's very interesting to see how wrestling has changed since then. And hopefully in another show, I'll be able to discuss it. Um, but that did happen nine years ago today. Also in the news, we have the New Day um, being celebrated on Twitter for um, being together for six years without splitting up. Of course, you know, the New Day is made up of Kofi Kingston, Big E, and Xavier Woods, who's been out with injury. And they've been together for so very long at this point that it's almost like you can't see one without the other or picture them without each other at this point. And it blows my mind to see how the New Day started, in a sense, and how they were all three of them were at a crossroads in their, you know, prospective careers when they were brought together as a group. And it's funny because in one interview that they did on Talk is Jericho, which is another great wrestling podcast hosted by Chris Jericho, who's like a wrestling legend, um... They talked about how when they came together, their initial gimmick was, was supposed to be preachers and how they were supposed to be, you know, sort of labeled as old school preachers. But they decided to, to sort of put in their um, juice into it, <laughs> if you will, and become like these sort of Kirk Franklin-esque type preachers as opposed to old school golden age gospel type preachers. But what's so funny is, aside from being preachers, they were actually able to put in parts of themselves and their culture in terms of black men and the things that they're into in terms of, you know, nerd culture, like video games and different TV shows and stuff like that into what they love. And the rest is history. You know, they've, you know, won eight tag team championships, um, which is probably the most of any team at, or any stable at this point. They have... They have a collect, they basically collectively were behind Kofi Kingston last year in his run as WWE champion because they pushed for it for so very long. And I'm more than sure that 
if Big E were to ever have some type of singles push or whatever, they will Xavier and, and Kofi would be rooting for him the entire time. And I think that's one thing I really love that the New Day sort of portray. I love the fact that they can root for each other to succeed separately as opposed to it leading to them break up in some way, shape, or form. Because there have been a lot of times where a lot of people have said, oh, the New Day are going to break up if Big E decides to go on a singles run, or if Xavier decides to go on a singles run, or if Kofi decided to go on another singles run, then the New Day would have to break up. And that's not necessarily the case. Like, you can chase success and chase you know what you love and you don't necessarily have to lose your friends in the process and I think that's a level of brotherhood that's sort of missing in wrestling so I am absolutely you know thrilled that they have lasted for this long and I only hope that if it's meant to be you know they will last for a lot longer because what they have to offer the company and what they have to offer in wrestling is always something unique and special and I also appreciate the fact that over the past few weeks with everything that's been going on in the world with um, Black Lives Matter they have been able to express and show their support for the movement by wearing armbands of the names of different people who are affected by violence by <clears throat> law enforcement or violence in different in other ways ways shape or forms over the past couple of weeks so i love the new day and everything that they have to give and i hope and pray they last super long <laughs> so also in the news we have Tessa Blanchard being fired by Impact Wrestling. And what's so interesting about this is the fact that, as you know, the crisis has been affecting a lot of businesses. And with Impact Wrestling, this is a different wrestling promotion other than WWE that's on television as well. They come on on Tuesdays if you ever want to check them out. They have basically been on a standstill in terms of their filming but once they started filming again, Tessa Blanchard, who was their world champion at the time, wasn't shooting footage for them to use as she was in Mexico or or something like that. And because she didn't shoot the footage, Impact decided to go ahead and let her go, even though her contract was set to was was up in a few months. They decided to fire her and just strip her of the world title because, of course, you can't be the <clears throat> You can't be the world heavyweight champion and not participate in what the and what's going on on the show now that the show is back up and running. And what's so weird about it is she's generated some interest in other promotions now that she's, you know, out of impact. But I wonder if they're thinking about the big picture in terms of hiring her after allegations came out earlier this year of her possibly being a racist in a match because there was one black female wrestler and I can't remember her name right now who basically tweeted around the time that Tessa was up was basically supposed to wrestle for the world title in impact wrestling against Sammy Callahan this black female wrestler mentioned that she was wrestling a match with her or saw her wrestling a match with another black woman and she called her the n-word and spit in her face and this caused a huge uproar amongst a lot of female wrestlers who came out and said mentioned different moments where they wrestled tessa blanchard and she wasn't exactly as nice to them either and it's so sad because Tessa is really talented. She is the daughter of Tully Blanchard, who was one of who was a part of the legendary Four Horsemen with Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. And it's just like who in the world? You know, it's like you want to believe how you want to believe that she's so very talented and all this other stuff. And you have all these dream matches dreamed up in your mind. But I'm wondering if any of these companies will want the firestorm that will come with hiring her in the midst of all the stuff that's going on with um, Black Lives Matter and all that other stuff. Like, how in the world can you hire this person who is accused of racist behavior, you know, and in the midst of all this mess? Like, it would be a social media crap storm, but we'll just wait and see. And finally, in wrestling fan news, we have The Undertaker in his retirement after 30 years in the business. Now, on the WWE Network, they were showing a 
documentary of sorts that was sort of patterned after, you know, ESPN's The Last Dance with um, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. But it was centered around The Undertaker and how he's been able to sort of push forward and wrestle, you know, his matches maybe once or twice a year um, as he's grown older and how he balances that with his family life and what and how there's so much mystique around when he's supposed to possibly retire and all of the above. Well, in the final episode, <laughs> he announced that he feels like he wrestled his last match, which was this eight, which was this past April at WrestleMania against AJ Styles in the Boneyard match. And with that being said, it's come out in a sense that he has basically said that this is it like this is my last match I'm finished and it was kind of surreal to hear because for the longest time a lot of people really thought that his match with Roman Reigns was going to be it because he took off his because at the end of that match he had lost that match in Orlando and he had took off his hat and he had took off his jacket and left it in the middle of the ring and you know kissed his wife Michelle McCool and you know hugged his child and then walked off and you know was lowered um into the into the ramp after the match was over with his fist in the air and a lot of people cried and stuff and thought that that was the end but as it turns out it wasn't the end and he wound up wrestling a couple of more matches you know in the, in the past few years and he sort of struggled in the documentary he mentioned how he was struggling with figuring out which match was going to be it for him you know and the and he mentioned how he wanted to wrestle against AJ Styles because he felt like you know he was one of the best in the business which is true so he went to AJ talked to him about you know wrestling this boneyard match and it was one of the best theatrical matches anyone has ever seen um period and then you know if you've watched WrestleMania and if you haven't I suggest you watch it you know to see what you know thematic wrestling can very well be and how it's at its best with that match and while I was watching that match I felt like that was it because he sort of rode off on a motorcycle and it felt like in this match he was able to combine you know Ministry of Darkness and Magic Undertaker with his biker taker you know persona that he had sort of like during the late 90s and early 2000s and he rode off into the sunset and, you know, the, at the Undertaker logo on the barn. So in my mind, that felt like the end that felt like him riding off to the sunset, but there was no confirmation until the documentary came out and the, he said what he said. And on SmackDown yesterday, they were able, they paid tribute to the Undertaker, you know, at the beginning and the end of the show. And I'll talk about that more um, later on, but 30 years in the business is a long time. Like he started wrestling in 1990. This is 2020. So I respect him so much because if you think about wrestling, if you talk to people who aren't necessarily wrestling fans, who are diehard wrestling fans, you know, they'll mention two people to you. They'll mention Ric Flair or they'll, or they'll mention, well, three people rather. They'll mention Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, or The Undertaker. And he was so popular in terms of wrestling lore that you couldn't ever picture wrestling without him. And, you know, his dedication and his consistency with the business will always be something to cherish and hold on to. So I wish him, you know, Godspeed in his, you know, next journey in terms of retiring and in terms of chilling out. And I also wish him luck in sort of teaching the future because there was some, you know, footage of him in the documentary going back to the performance center and talking to these big guys, you know, in NXT who are finding their way, you know, in wrestling as well. So I wish him the very best in that um, and in whatever he decides to do. And I thank him for his contributions in my life because I was actually able to see one of his WrestleMania matches with Triple H in Atlanta and yeah thank you undertaker thank you mark calloway thank you for everything that you've done and thank you to michelle mccool and his other children for sharing him with us you know so yeah that's all that's going on in news and gossip ish and now we're going to move towards wrestling fan story time where i speak about the speaking out movement that has taken place stay tuned So 
So in wrestling fan story time, I'm going to discuss everything that's been going on with the speaking out movement. Now, since I was on break last weekend, I got to see a lot of it explode all over Twitter, where there were so many women and men as well, who talked about different stories where they had been touched inappropriately or forced or forcibly put in situations where they were sexually abused and it broke my heart because in wrestling there is so much positivity or at least it's done so much for me in my own life and even with it have done as much as it has done in my life it's just the fact that you have some dark components of it just like you have dark components of anything in life everything isn't you know sunshine rainbows and unicorns but last week to watch the to look at the numerous stories that i read where women were women and men were placed in situations where they were abused by people who they looked up to or abused by people you know who they wanted to just work with just made me sick to my stomach because it just goes to show you the power dynamic that people have over people isn't just relegated to the workplace and in offices or the or even at home it's also in the wrestling business as well and honestly what I would just like to say is if there's any female or male wrestler who feels like you know they've been inappropriately you know dealt with in any way shape or form they can always either come to me or come to someone um who will be open to listening to what they have to say and fighting for their voice and fighting for their justice um it was heartbreaking to have to hear all those stories as a woman myself i have never really been harassed in that way or abused in that way but i've learned over the course of the past few years of my life that i can't tell a person whether or not their pain is real i can't invalidate their experience the only thing i can do is just be a person who will listen to them and be someone you know who they can come to if they need someone to fight for them and i've had wrestlers on my i've been i've been blessed enough to have wrestlers come on my show and talk about their experiences in the business. And I hope to have more wrestlers come on my show, more referees come on my show, or anybody come on my show. And if there is something that they want to discuss in terms of that in, t- in terms of that subject, they can discuss it if they want to. But if they don't, then that's fine as well. But honestly, this is not a show that's ran by a person who is okay with anyone being abused in any way shape or form i don't have any excuses or any room for people in my life who seek to abuse people with their power or with their fame like as i appreciate the fact that some of these that some of these men and women have come out with their stories because there has been a huge reckoning with it like some of them have been ran off social media some of them have um apologize for their past behavior and for things that they have said like with the Sammy Guevara situation and what he said about Sasha Banks I won't repeat it you can just google that um but it won't be repeated on this show and just know that what he said about her was just absolutely reprehensible and you know you know better and if you know better do better so these women and these men sacrifice themselves day in and day out for our entertainment. They come on television and fight whatever it is they're going through personally to come on television and entertain us or go to live shows and entertain us for, you know, us to escape and go to another world because of and to, and to escape anything that's going on in our regular lives. And these people deserve nothing but the credit and the love and every piece of blessings that they deserve for doing that type of thing. They shouldn't have to fight all of these battles involving people not knowing how to deal with them or people not knowing how to see them as equal human beings. 
you know, as they're, you know, fighting for the right to be able to do their job correctly and all of the above. People like Sasha Banks, who is arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest female wrestler at this point or this stage or in the past 10 years, should not have to tell someone not to violate them or to say how much they wanted to violate them based on how attractive they are. These women have fought tooth and nail to be seen as equal to the men, if not better than the men. And they did not come this far only to have come this far. Um, If they don't feel safe with the people that they work with, then where can they feel safe? And if the men can't feel safe with who they work with, then where can they feel safe? Because just yesterday, even on Twitter, there was um, rumors that the Velveteen Dream might be supposedly fired based off of hearsay about stuff that he may have done. Now, I'm not saying it's true and I'm not saying it isn't true. But what I am saying is this, though, like there is there are levels like there are levels to feeling safe you should be able to feel safe at home and you should be able to feel safe at work and any person who's making someone feel uncomfortable at work at a place where they should be thriving and you know to survive on their own in the outside world to try to make a living you know that's just not right they shouldn't be made to feel unsafe anywhere and they shouldn't be made to feel exposed because of how they look or because of their body parts or all of the above so I am you know gutted at all of these stories and I'm glad that there is some accountability that's being held towards some of these people who did participate in stuff like this because there are a lot of people who wrestled for NXT UK with WWE who have been let go and fired And rightfully so. And there are people who are being investigated, even in AEW, and let go, even, well, not even let go in AEW, but people who are being suspended in AEW and having their salaries donated to, you know, to not societies, but donated to organizations that deal with these sort of things, which is great and all of the above. But it starts at home. We have to, we have to start teaching our kids that it's not okay, you know to make someone feel bad about themselves based off of how they look or based off of what you know what they believe or stuff like that like it starts at home and if you aren't acting right at home and if you're not being taught to act right at home then of course you're going to go out in public and say stupid stuff that you're not supposed to say so I'm glad that these men and women spoke up and said what they said I'm glad that many of their colleagues in wrestling decided to make them feel safe in speaking out, you know, and telling their stories. And I hope that it could continue in a healthy way in which people is using, people are using this hashtag to sort of tell the truth about what's happened to them so that people can be held accountable for it so that we can create a safer environment for our wrestlers to thrive and be who they are meant to be and be who they are called to be. So continue to speak out not even just in wrestling but in in every facet of life if you work even in retail or if you work you know in in a high-powered office structure you know just if something has happened to you please speak out please tell someone who you know absolutely cares about you and we will fight for you and we will yell for you and knock stuff over for you (laughs) um just continue to speak out so that so stuff like this won't have to happen anymore and that's the end of wrestling fan story time speak out y'all okay so now we're going to discuss what happened this week in wrestling starting with monday night raw Something interesting that's been bubbling is the fact that Lana <laughs> is now getting a divorce from Bobby Lashley because Bobby Lashley hooked up with well he well he didn't hook up let me not say that he basically chose MVP to be his new manager which made him get more focused and basically go for a title match with Drew McIntyre who's a champion and of course he lost at Backlash and because due to Lana distracting him or whatever. And last week, um, 
MVP called Lana a thought on national television. I thought that was really like the craziest thing ever. But um, basically, Lana and Bobby Lashley broke up. So in the midst of that, Lana has now um, become the manager of Natalia. And it's pretty interesting because they haven't really discussed fully really why they've connected. But I'm sort of here. I'm kind of here for Lana being a manager for a woman wrestler as opposed to her being a manager for a dude at this point because it seems like she's always a manager for a guy um and she was like that even with her husband Rusev who's no longer with the company so I'm really interested to see what how they're going to explain them hooking up but either way Natalia had a match with Liv Morgan and Natalia won the match under nefarious means and what kind of upset me about that is the fact that they have so much potential with Liv Morgan to do so many different new things with her because she's so very talented and her athleticism has gotten considerably and immeasurably better since she's come back and all of the above but I just don't feel like they really have her in the right story but it's looking like that might change because she was backstage and Ruby Riot, who was like her former best friend in the riot squad or whatever actually tried to talk to her and try to figure out what was wrong but Liv didn't want to hear it and she didn't trust her so I'm very intrigued as to where that storyline is gonna go also on Raw with the women you had the women's tag team champions Sasha Banks and Bayley who's also the Smackdown women's champion come on and talk about how they basically sought to be on a tear for the week and everything so basically um they had a match with the iconics who they've been going back and forth with um in their rivalry as a tag team unit because the iconics really do want to win their women's tag team titles back but it seems like they're going on this um bailey and sasha banks tear which is great because they're talented and everything but it's pretty funny what happened afterward because they won their match and the match was good and everything but now it led to Sasha challenging Asuka for her Raw Women's Championship after um after Asuka won her match against Charlotte Flair on this show as well which was very surprising because as of this point Charlotte of course had always beaten Asuka ever since Wrestlemania two years ago where they fought and Oscar lost her undefeated streak and the SmackDown women's title to Charlotte and stuff. And even though they wish each other the best and everything, it was almost like for every time Oscar and Charlotte were set to fight each other, she always beat her except this Monday she act like Oscar actually beat her and submitted her out because Charlotte got into a brawl earlier in the night with Nia Jax, who was mad that she lost um, her match against Oscar at backlash and then she had a rematch with her the monday night after backlash and still lost so she was protesting at the beginning of the show and she was talking about like i deserve another opportunity because i got screwed out of my opportunity blah 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 bitter blah 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 bitter blah 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 bitter so (laughs) so charlotte interrupted her and then they were basically you know catting back and forth at each other and then they were fighting one another and then naya injured charlotte's arm but charlotte being charlotte was gonna go ahead and wrestle the match against oscar anyway and oscar basically um used all kinds of submissions and everything to attack charlotte's arm and charlotte literally tapped out to oscar and she looked really sad about it and then when they showed her backstage sort of nursing her own wounds naya attacked her some more and that sort of led to charlotte being led off of television for a while um because she's going out to get some type of surgery and we wish her the best in that so also i had also previously mentioned how sasha banks had challenged oscar for her raw women's title at extreme rules which they're beginning to beef up now because extreme rules is happening in three weeks on the wwe network as a pay-per-view event um because i believe sasha was talking about how she was jealous of bailey because um bailey has two belts because she's smackdown women's champion and a tag team champion so now sasha wants to be you know 
wants to also have two belts as well but it was so funny because in that promo she was giving off the impression that she wanted to go after bailey for her smackdown women's title and make it seem like you know i'm gonna fight you but then she flex around and just turn it around on oscar now as happy as i am that sasha and oscar are gonna fight each other again because the last time they fought each other was really good i feel discontented with the fact that they're using so many people that we see on television all the time as opposed to utilizing their newer talent now as great as those matches would be with Asuka and Sasha it's just I would much I would much rather them actually give that opportunity to somebody like Liv Morgan or like Bianca Belair or even Shayna Baszler who we haven't seen on TV since Money in the Bank or since Bianca is wrestling on main event now, it's just like there are so many newer women that they could put in the title picture. And the fact that you're putting someone who already has a tag team championship, you know, in a match against Asuka, it's just kind of like, what's the point? Like, I understand it will make for a good match. And I do understand that Sasha does deserve this kind of push at this point in her career because she's the GOAT, in my opinion. It's just there are so many new people who could actually use that rub so um we'll see what happens with that and that's basically all that's been happening with the women on raw but with the men it's basically a whole lot going on the show started with drew mcintyre sort of you know coming out to celebrate you know him be still being champion and all of that But then Dolph Ziggler interrupted because he's been traded to Raw since AJ Styles went back to SmackDown. And he um, mentioned the history that they have because they were a tag team a few years ago when Drew McIntyre came up to the main roster. But he wants to challenge McIntyre, you know, for his WWE championship. But then McIntyre called him a Jack A word and basically said, if you really want a title match, you know, just, you know, let's fight at extreme rules and let's do it and it's cool to see Dolph Ziggler sort of do this go after the WWE championship simply because of the fact that he's always like oh it should be me and you know he hasn't really gone after the title since Kofi Kingston had it and he's so very talented he's been world heavyweight champion before if you remember his cash in um all those years ago Jesus Christ all those years ago um on Alberto Del Rio but he has really had that much of an opportunity to hold a giant a big significant title like that one in such a long period of time and he and his athleticism is through the roof and he's just really an amazing wrestler and this is going to be cool to see you know him and Dolph you know tear it up at extreme rules so that's going to be really interesting and then the street profits fought the viking raiders after weeks of like all these different competitions with axe throwing and bowling and basketball and mini golf and all this other stuff and becoming the (laughs) the viking prophets or you know the street raiders or whatever you know and coming together and fighting ninjas they finally fought in a tag team match to prove which tag team was the best and this match was really entertaining and really good and one of my favorite parts of the match was basically how um Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford hit the um cash out and then Montez hit probably the greatest frog splash I'd ever seen because his airtime with that frog splash is so cool and for those who don't know a frog splash is like where you jump from the top rope and your body sort of curves you know it, it sort of curves into a little bit of a ball but then it opens up as you land on the wrestler on the um mat and it's just really cool to see. And to see, you know, the Street Profits retain was also a nice, you know, bump up for them because when it when the feud with the Viking Raiders started, the Viking Raiders were basically saying, anything you could do, we could do better, you know, and we're the better tag team. But this proves that the Street Profits really does have staying power as a tag team. And it also doesn't hurt that Raw and SmackDown both have black tag team champions. So, hey, ha ha. But... <laughs> After that, um, Zelina Vega led, you know, as the Street Pops were celebrating their win, Zelina Vega led Andrade and Angel, who have seemingly, you know, 
brush their differences aside to attack the street prophets and then the viking raiders came to their aid and angel and andrade want to go for the tag team titles now and i'm not mad about that because i've got sick of watching them fight amongst each other and i guess Zelina got sick of it too so she got them together in some way shape or form and now they're fighting for the tag titles and i'm not opposed to that because they they have the makings of a good group um but i was worried about them because it's like they put them together and then they started fighting and then they kicked Austin Theory out and then they kept fighting and it was just too much. So I'm glad this is going to be a different, you know, a different story for the Street Profits to tell and go after, you know, Andrade and Angel because they're really talented and they deserve to go after, you know, more titles and stuff if they're not going to do it separately as of yet. So that's going to be really cool. And then, of course, Edge and Randy Orton are still going on with their beef and I'm tired of it. <laughs> I'm so tired of it. Um, basically, Edge did a promo basically saying like, you know, I see now I'm going to have to go rated our superstar on you since you think, you know, you want to brag about being the greatest superstar ever after winning the greatest wrestling match ever and all this other stuff. And he was talking about how Randy Orton beat up on Christian who isn't, who is like, edge's best friend of over 30 years they basically started in a wrestling business together in canada and they're both retired well no edge isn't retired at this point but christian still is but christian was on tv um a couple weeks ago and he wanted to fight randy orton but randy orton basically you know said okay i'll challenge you to an unsanctioned match and when christian came out there R rick flair came out there and basically gave him a a shot to the nuts <laughs> hit him in his nuts so Randy Orton could win the match or whatever and punted him in the head and Edge did not like that because Randy Orton basically went off went after his best friend who was defenseless and couldn't fight for himself so now Edge is really pissed about it so now he wants to fight Randy Orton again so oh my gosh and now Randy Orton you know was looking kind of scared in that match you know scared you know once he had cut that promotion and everything so i'm so tired of watching these two people fight i don't know what to do i want edge to fight new people i want edge to fight kevin owens like i want edge to fight aj styles i want edge to fight other people besides randy orton and there's no diss to randy orton because he's great but ew, stop it anyway um, Akira Tozawa won a 24-7 title, him and all his ninjas, so that's fun. And Randy Orton is also getting ready to fight the big show who's angry at him and everything. And he's done. So that's interesting. And then Seth Rollins is still going after um Rey Mysterio and his son and Dominic isn't backing down at all because it's all about family y'all Fast and Furious reference I'm sorry um <laughs> Rey, Rey Mysterio has been injured because of Seth Rollins attacking his eye a couple weeks ago and Dominic his son if you're like a diehard wrestling fan you know that Dominic's son has been in the wrestling business you know for a little while but he kind of wanted to avenge his father, you know, from being attacked and everything. And Ray addressed Dominic and said, you know, I didn't like that you did what you did. I understand why, but I was still very worried because you'll always be my child and stuff. But then Seth was just like, you know what, I'm just going to sacrifice your son and I'm going to, you know, you know, poke his eye out and all this other stuff. And it's just kind of like, I am so tired <laughs> of Seth just thinking he's just going to put Ray out of his misery or whatever. Because Seth is always talking at Ray Mysterio saying, you know, you're a legend and you're respected, but you need to know when it's time for you to go and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, Ray Mysterio will leave the business when he says he's going to leave the business and you're not going to make him leave. Oh, and literally he almost took Dominic's eye out as well. But then you had Aleister Black and um, Humberto Carrillo come out and help save him you know from being sacrificed so i don't know if this is going to lead to like an eight man or a three man tag team match or something but 
the one thing I do want to see more of is Dominic wrestle because I'll never forget at Survivor Series last year where he where Ray was getting ready to fight um, Brock Lesnar for the WWE title. And Dominic came out there and was doing all kinds of frog splashes and 619s. Um, and it was just kind of like, oh, my God, Dominic, why aren't you wrestling? Like, come on. Like, we will welcome you, babe. Come on. But it's just I think the story is still very interesting in and of itself. So we'll see what happens leading up to um, Extreme Rules on Raw. And now we're just going to go to what happened on NXT. right so we're gonna go to nxt what happened on nxt 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 what wednesday show okay i'm sorry y'all anyway nxt (laughs) so with the women we had kaden carter and casey canzar who are besties in real life going up against dakota kai and raquel gonzalez who are besties in real life but they're bullies too so you know they're bestie bullies anyway they had a tag team match against each other and one of the biggest surprises coming out of this match was seeing the athleticism and the aggression of Caden Carter that I think we hadn't really been able to see a lot of but I was really excited to see it from her because I've been a fan of her ever since you know she was um named Lacey Lane um when she came to the May Young Classic a couple years ago and I was always interested in seeing what else you know she could possibly do and it was really cool because her and um Casey have this chemistry as a tag team which could lead to them getting you know opportunities at the women's tag title seeing as Sasha and Bailey have been defending the titles in all three brands so that's going to be really cool and interesting to see now Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez have been have had a dominant foothold in the women's division ever since Dakota Kai decided to turn heel and then ever since of course Raquel decided to align with Dakota Kai as she was feuding with Tegan Knox, who used to be her best friend and they won this match this time and after this match I think Dakota wanted to challenge Io Shirai who is the NXT women's champion at this point And I think that'll be a good story to tell. You know, you have two very aggressive um, and talented women going against each other. So that'll be really cool. So we'll see if Gonzalez will play the X factor in that match. That is if it happens. So that'll be interesting. Then also on the women's side, we had Aaliyah um, versus Rhea Ripley. (laughs) Aaliyah versus Rhea. You know, it's cool to say. Um... Lately, Rhea Ripley has sort of been, you know, feeling some type of way because she sort of slid off, you know, her championship run. She wasn't able to win the title um, at TakeOver In Your House. But she has been accosted constantly by Robert Stone, who's this manager guy who used to manage Chelsea Green. But Chelsea fired him. So now he's been sort of disheveled and acting drunk and crazy with torn up suits and everything but he's trying to bounce back because he he's found Aaliyah to be his pot to be his possible new client and she's been trying to impress him but he was also trying to get Rhea Ripley on his team so now she's just like no get out of my face and she's thrown him in the trash can like two times and beat him up and basically um Ripley beat Aaliyah with a riptide and everything, even though Robert Stone tried to distract um, and everything, but it just didn't work because Rhea Ripley is so smart and she's so, you know, aggressive and athletic. So that really didn't work. So now what they're going to do is have some sort of, I guess, handicap match, I believe this coming Wednesday, where now... If Rhea loses the match, she'll have to join the Robert Stone brand. And that's not going to (laughs) work because Rhea Ripley is not a brand person. She's not a person that you can just stick in a man, you know, with a manager because she's her own woman. Like, that's not going to work out at all. 
And then her working with Aaliyah, who's just kind of like, who has this sort of bougie, you know, character, that's just not going to work out. So we'll just see what happens. But I just don't think that's really going to work out that well this coming Wednesday. Also, um, this, what's coming this coming Wednesday is the fact since it's the week of Independence Day, they're doing the great, they're theming this episode of NXT based off of the Great American Bash. Now, for those who don't know, the Great American Bash was this pay-per-view that WCW used to have, you know, and Dusty Rhodes, you know, rest in peace, actually founded that pay-per-view, but WWE, of course, bought the rights to it when they acquired and bought WCW in the um, 90s and early 2000s, so now they um, have the right to use the Great American Bash however they see fit, so now NXT is going to be that, and then they've also announced a match between Sasha Banks and Io Shirai and it's going to be a non-title match but you know this is going to be a banger because um Sasha Banks is the GOAT and Io Shirai is the GOAT as well so we got two GOATs fighting in a match against each other you know it's going to be amazing so I'm ready I'm ready ready okay um (laughs) it's doing a lot of singing and that's pretty much all that's going on with the women on NXT. Now with the men, we had Cameron Grimes versus um, Damian Priest. And Cameron Grimes, he's okay. He's scrappy and all of the above. Like, he's okay. But I just hate how Grimes won over Damian Priest because I'm just wondering what exactly is the point of Damian Priest at this point? Because they were sort of pushing him to a certain degree but I don't know if if in the grand scheme of NXT he's supposed to either put people over or is he just supposed to be this this big guy who is a bad guy but then he's a good guy again like he's he I don't know he seems kind of lost in the shuffle a bit and I want more for him because he's really big and talented and he's also kind of cute too. You know, he's a little bit attractive. You know, he's got a nice voice and all that. So I just <laughs> I just want him to do more. And losing to Cameron Grimes just isn't a good look for me. So I don't know. Then we had Jake Atlas fighting Santos Escobar um, in the cruiserweight division. Because as you know, well, if you don't know, Santos Escobar... Um, disguised himself as El Hijo del Fantasma and he wound up winning the Cruiserweight Championship Tournament by beating Drake Maverick. Now Drake Maverick wanted to challenge him you know for the title now that he's been hired back in the company and everything but as he was challenging him Santos Escobar um had these two other mass luchadors attack him revealing themselves to be Joaquin Wilde and Raul Mendoza and they're sort of like doubling as well they're not doubling they're sort of like this new Mexican faction and it's amazing because they give off the vibes that I think I would I was looking for from Andrade and Angel but they're a little bit more you know legit with it so Santos had a match versus Jake Atlas who was who did participate in the cruiserweight um he participated in the cruiserweight tournament as well and that match was pretty good so Escobar won that match so basically they're building up Santos Escobar leading up to this Um, confrontation that he's eventually going to have with Drake Maverick because he did attack Drake Maverick and threw him through a table and all the above and sent him away in the hospital so that's gonna happen eventually so I'm excited about that um, part and then you had Karrion Cross versus Bronson Reed the resident thick boy and Bronson Reed was actually able to give Karrion Cross a run for his money which is You know, which is something that we hadn't really seen since Karrion Cross came up to NXT. He's been sort of dominating people like he like he's like a scary person who hits these really scary suplexes on people and ruins their backs and necks for no reason at all. So um, it was really interesting, but I was glad Bronson was able to sort of get in a little bit of offense on him. And now I guess Karrion is sort of putting forth his efforts toward a championship match with Adam Cole or whoever is holding the title at that time 
So yeah, and also and also I just want to reiterate how amazing I feel that Carrion Cross's entrance is with Scarlett um Bordeaux. Um she's singing the theme song but she's mouthing it and it's one of the greatest entrances I've ever seen. And I think Mauro said it best. He like he had called I'm trying to remember what he called Carrion Cross. It was something about Doomsday or something, but it was amazing. But either way, like, he's just so scary. And I'm just ready for him to do more. And then there was a match with Dexter Loomis versus Roderick Strong. And Loomis... I never imagined that in 2020 we would be rooting for a wrestler who has the persona of a serial killer. I just never imagined it ever. But here we are. (laughs) Dexter Loomis basically dominated Roderick Strong to a certain degree. So Roderick is still freaked out by him. So that was interesting. And then we had the final match, which was Keith Lee versus Finn Balor versus Johnny Gargano. Now, so basically, whoever won this triple threat match was going to go on to face Adam Cole in a winner-take-all situation. So now, basically, whoever had won this match was going to retain the end, was going to either retain or win the NXT North American title and go on to face Adam Cole in a winner's take all match for the NXT championship and the NXT North American championship. And this match was basically all over the place in such a good way that you saw all of these wrestlers sort of showing off their best assets in terms of power and strikes in terms of Finn Balor and then with Johnny Gargano his mat wrestling ability it was just a really good match but Keith Lee wound up coming out victorious so he retained his NXT North American title so now he's gonna go on to face Adam Cole for he's gonna go on to face Adam Cole for the NXT and North American championships now, I'm not exactly sure when this is supposed to be happening. I'm not sure if it's going to happen this coming Wednesday or maybe at another pay-per-view or something like that. But that's going to be interesting to see if they're going to let Keith Lee go all the way as a star or if they're just going to let Adam Cole take all the belts. Hmm. So that's basically what happened on NXT this week. And now we're going to go to SmackDown. Okay, so now we're going to discuss what happened on SmackDown last night. And with the women with SmackDown, they only had really one segment and one match. You had Alexa Bliss versus Nikki Cross versus Dana Brooke versus Lacey Evans for the in a fatal four-way match for the number one contendership for Bayley's SmackDown women's title. And they, of course, she came out with Sasha Banks to watch the match on commentary and they were being loud and you know, heelish, which is bad guy-ish on commentary or whatever. And they were watching the match and the match was pretty by the numbers and what could you, and basically what you could expect from these four women in terms of their athleticism or whatever. And Nikki Cross came out the winner. And I thought that was really interesting to sort of see her um, and Alexa Bliss sort of come together, but then not come together at the same time because you're used to seeing them as a tag team mat as a as a tag team in matches but now they sort of had to separate themselves and focus on the opportunity in terms of a singles um title run and Nikki Cross wound up being the victor and I thought that was really great for her because she's never really gone for a singles title before so I'm excited for Nikki in that aspect but I was disappointed because there was no Naomi or Tamina and they were in that segment last week where they were talking about um, how they were sick and tired of Bailey and Sasha running roughshod through the women's division, but they weren't anywhere in that match. So I'm just like, um, where are my women of color at? Where they're at? I'm disappointed. But 
I don't know if, if it's because they have stuff going on or if they're trying to avoid the crisis or whatever, but it was just kind of disappointing to not see them. But congratulations to Nikki, though. I mean, it's going to be a good opportunity for her to go, you know, to fight Bailey. So that would be good. Um, and that's pretty much all that happened with the women on SmackDown. But at the beginning of the show, you had a montage paying tribute to The Undertaker because, like I said earlier in the show, he announced his retirement, you know, after 30 years in the business. And they showed this beautiful montage from the beginning of his career in 1990 at Survivor Series all the way to now with his match against AJ Styles, which they wound up showing um, for the first hour. And I was glad that they actually showed that because it helped a lot of his fans to sort of you know, appreciate that Boneyard match that he had at WrestleMania in April a whole lot more than we initially did. Now, mind you, it was already critically lauded as one of the best parts of the WrestleMania weekend. Um, and a lot of people talked about it, you know, in terms of the press and ESPN, CBS and stuff like that. But and it was a great thematic, you know, episode. And it was weird to see, you know, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson in that match too, knowing what happened to them and now they're gone. But... It was beautiful. It gave a new it gave me a new appreciation for the Undertaker in the sense that he was able to combine all three parts of himself in that match with Mark Calloway and Biker Taker and Ministry of Darkness Magical Taker, you know, all in one match. And it was just really great to look at and to appreciate because this is really it for him. So I was glad they showed that match again, even though they showed it with commercials. But, you know, what are you going to do? It's television. So <laughs> that was interesting. And then you had um, back in the normal swing of things of the show, you had the New Day and the Lucha House Party versus Cesaro, Shinsuke Nakamura, The Miz and John Morrison. And on commentary, you had Corey Graves still beefing up Miz and Morrison's Hey, 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 Ho, Ho song, which isn't popular at all but somehow or another he's acting like it's the greatest thing to happen in music since thriller but he actually said that not me um <laughs> and then you had the new day come out with their armbands paying tribute to ayana jones and tamir rice who are two young children who had their lives tragically taken away um due to the abuse of power of um law enforcement and they're still doing their activist thing and that match was amazing in the sense that Lince Dorado and Grand Metal League had an opportunity to show off their high flying skills, you know, and I feel like they're, and I've said it before, I feel like they're so underrated with what they've, you know, what they offer because so many people be like, oh, Lucha, they're just, you know, the dancing, you know, Lucha guys with the cool song, but really they don't give them a whole lot of credit for the type of, you know, Lucha wrestling that they do and what they bring to the table in terms of that. So they wound up winning the match after, you know, after the New Day got to fighting with Cesaro and Nakamura outside of the ring and backstage. So they wound up winning the match for them. And I thought that was really good, you know, that they got the win over Miz and Morrison in that way. So we'll see if WWE is going to prepare them for a tag title run. But it's looking like they're sort of going for Nakamura and Cesaro to be, you know, the new the new people to beef with the new day right now but we'll see how that goes and then we have baron corbin versus jeff hardy now earlier in the night you had baron corbin throw mad shade at the undertaker and basically talk about how he's how unimportant he is and how all this time he was holding um young dudes like him back and he basically told undertaker he sucked right but jeff hardy you know being as what he called a graduate from um dead man university came out there and defended the undertaker and said you know the undertaker you know helped me and basically helped him grow as a wrestler so he's not gonna let baron corbin talk all this crap about him so they fought in their match and jeff hardy wound up winning the match with with his um signature move and it was cool and everything and he he, he basically hit him with a swanton bomb in order for, to win the match but then corbin attacked jeff hardy you know and didn't let him really celebrate that but then big e came out and hit the big ending on baron corbin and then braun Strowman basically joined him to help take out the king and all of that and it was just really cool to see all these wrestlers come together 
And at the end, you had, um, they showed a picture of The Undertaker on the screen and with his pose that he does, you know, where he's on one knee and he's doing the tongue out with his eyes rolling in the back of his head kind of thing. I remember they used to scare me as a child. But anyway, um, and Jeff Hardy did the arm out pose that he, that The Undertaker used to do where he was, you know, used to claim he'll take your soul and all that. And that was really like a full circle moment because years ago, Jeff Hardy and The Undertaker or Biker Taker wrestled in a match on Monday Night Raw. And it was a ladder match, I believe, for for the um, WWE Championship. And The Undertaker beat him. But that night, Jeff Hardy had earned so much of his respect that he held his arm up, you know, at the end of it. And they showed pictures of it on Twitter and everything. So I thought it was beautiful how that moment was very full circle because Jeff Hardy with all of his struggles still appreciated what Undertaker has done as a lot of wrestlers talked about that night they show clips of John Cena talking about you know how much he respects the Undertaker and Batista and um Randy Orton and Ric Flair talking about you know how much they love they love the Undertaker and how he's the greatest character in the history of the business and if you really think about it, The Undertaker has been this consistent character through, throughout all of this time. It's like, even as kayfabe or um, wrestling storylines have sort of blurred between reality and what's you know not real in terms of the TV shows, The Undertaker has always been the mysterious figure that we always knew him to be. And it's just now at the point where we're finally seeing, you know, him as a real person or as Mark Calloway and it's lasted throughout all of this time and it's evolved in all of these different iterations so the Undertaker definitely deserves all the respect you know that he's getting at this point for maintaining his character for so very long and also with the men you had Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt you know talking at each other and Braun Strowman was getting possessed by an evil demon on television it was just like oh my god and because Bray Wyatt is trying to bring Braun Strowman back to him um, because they used to be connected with each other with the Wyatt family. But since Bray Wyatt is sort of drifting back to that Wyatt family character as opposed to his, you know, fiend character, he's trying to get in Braun Strowman's head because he's trying to win the universal title back. So they're going to fight probably at Extreme Rules and they're calling it the horror show. So I'm assuming that they're centering that around the Strowman and Bray Wyatt storyline so that's going to be interesting too so all in all Smackdown was great last night um so now that we've finished talking about everything that happened this week in wrestling we're going to go to the conclusion okay so thank you for listening to this episode of the hardy wrestling podcast and i also appreciate you if you listen to every episode i um feel like i say that every episode but i really do have to thank you because i'm so new to this and i'm just you know plugging through for every time and i'm just really working hard for this thing so i really appreciate it if you've stuck it out with me all this time and if you're new here i hope that the content that i create will actually you know keep you here as a fan So what I would like to say is if you have any questions for me, if you want to follow me or ask me any questions, please know that you can follow me on social media platforms on Facebook at Hardy Wrestling Podcast, or you can just type in the title of the podcast, Hardy Wrestling with Stephanie Hardy, or you can follow me on Instagram at Hardy Wrestling Podcast or on Twitter at Hardy WrestlePod. And you can also follow me on my regular Twitter, which is at Queen Steph Hardy. You can find it on the Twitter page for my podcast. And you can follow me on YouTube at Hardy Wrestling Podcast because every episode is posted on YouTube. And this one should be posted by at least tonight or um, tomorrow morning. And if you want to listen to me, you can listen to me on Spotify, iHeartRadio, like I said, YouTube earlier. Um, You can also listen to me on... Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, and basically just anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find me there. And I just appreciate those who listen to me who are wrestling fans. And I appreciate and I definitely appreciate those who listen to me who may not even be wrestling fans for those who may have started out watching wrestling in their youth and probably just fell off with it. Or for those who don't watch wrestling at all, but only, you know, 
want to know what's going on with it because I never really paid any attention before. I thank you for that. And hopefully I'll be able to do more um, collaborations with other wrestling podcasters as well who are um, putting their shows out there and stuff like that. And I appreciate those people who have actually, you know, helped me with different you know, questions that I've had in terms of, you know, putting my podcast out there and just continuing to do my very best. And I just hope and pray that I can continue to just give you guys a good show. So with that in mind, I will see you next week. And I hope that you guys are having a fantastic weekend and um, happy wrestling. And just I hope you're living a really happy life in spite of everything that's going on and you're staying safe. So until next time, this is Hardy Wrestling with me, your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Bye, y'all.